Welcome back to our Med Smarter Lecture Series, where we're taking a smarter approach to preparing future physicians. Before we get started, if you'll take just a quick minute and click that like button, and also subscribe and turn the bell on so that you'll be notified when we post new videos. Today we're going to begin our discussion on immunology. And the first thing that we need to do when we discuss immunology is discuss some anatomy. The organs of our immune system are divided up into primary organs and secondary organs. Our primary organs are going to be our bone marrow and our thymus. So with our bone marrow, our bone marrow is where we see immune cells being produced and where we see B cells maturing. Uh, bone marrow typically going to be your sternum as well as your femur. Uh, long bones are very common to be a location where uh, a lot of our bone marrow is a part of our primary uh, immune system. The thymus, which is up in the chest, um, posterior to the sternum, as you can see right here that I've circled in red, this is where our T cells mature. Beyond that, our secondary immune system organs are going to be our spleen, lymph nodes, tonsils, and Peyer's patches. Uh, we all know the spleen is going to be in the left upper quadrant. Our lymph nodes are all throughout the body. We have some under our arms and our neck, around our gut, uh, in our uh, inguinal areas. Tonsils, obviously, going to be in your throat, as you can see in this picture here. And then Peyer's patches are located in the gut of the small intestine, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner. So what do all these secondary immune system organs do? These are all allowing immune system cells to interact with the antigen. So they will go and find that antigen. Those cells will then present to that antigen and will continue along down that immune system response line. So let's look a little closer about some of our organs here. We'll first look into lymph nodes. So we said the lymph nodes are all throughout the body. So let's zoom in on just one lymph node here. This is what a individual lymph node looks like at a close up. It is a secondary lymphoid organ, as we already mentioned here, that has many afferents, which means coming towards. Uh, so your afferent limb here, that everything is coming towards our lymph node. And then it does have one or more efferents, which means going away. So in this particular picture here, this is our efferent, and everything is passing down out of that one particular lymph node. Each individual lymph node is encapsulated, uh, and they're trabeculae that encapsulate them. Uh, you can see these black lines around this particular uh, lymph node that we see here in this example, and those are your trabeculae that will encapsulate the lymph node. So all throughout you have these trabeculae encapsulating. How do they function? Uh, they do nonspecific filtration, so macrophages, uh, B and T cells circulate through, and then our immune system response activates from this particular uh, location in the lymph nodes. We actually can break down the lymph nodes into uh, three different main structures, uh, the first being a follicle. So what is a follicle? Well, first and foremost, this is where our B cells uh, will localize and proliferate from. The location of these are going to be in the outer cortex. Uh, this one particular uh, diagram doesn't have a great labeling of follicles, but we have primary and secondary follicles here. Uh, primary follicles are dense and quiescent, meaning they're uh, kind of hibernating or inactive. Uh, and all of these, like we said, are going to be in the outer cortex. So you can kind of see them um, on gross anatomy, not so much in this illustration, but they look like a bunch of circles, uh, typically towards the outside of the lymph node, as you can see what I'm drawing in here, okay? Uh, the secondary follicles, these are ones that have a pale central germinal centers, and they are active. So if you saw a gross anatomy photo of a lymph node, you'd be able to see those pale centers of the uh, secondary follicle, where the primary follicle will just be very dense. We don't have those pale centers. So you can kind of see, as I'm drawing here onto this uh, example, you draw, some of them are very dense and packed together. That's our primary follicles. And then the ones that have a uh, dark outside, almost just looks like an empty circle, with a pale inside, that is our secondary follicles. The next structure of the lymph node that we'll talk about is the medulla. The medulla consists of medullary cords and medullary sinuses. These are closely packed lymphocytes here and plasma cells 
and uh, they communicate with the efferent lymphatics, which are whatever comes out of the lymph node. So they communicate with the efferent lymphatics, and they contain reticular cells and macrophages. So you can see in this diagram, these medullary sinuses are going to be represented by the yellow lines. Uh, you can see I'm drawing them in red now, drawing over them. So these are basically allowing communication within the lymph node between the rest of the lymph node and the efferent lymphatics. And like we said earlier, they contain the reticular cells and the macrophages. Finally, the third structure of a lymph node that we're going to discuss is the paracortex. This is where we have our T cells located in the paracortex of the lymph nodes. This is uh, basically a region between the follicles and the medulla, which isn't very well uh, shown in this picture, but it's going to be the area down here. You remember I drew the follicles up here in the uh, perimeter? Well, the area down here, inferior to those, but not all the way into the medulla is where we have the paracortex. In this area, we have high endothelial venules through which the T and B cells will enter from the blood. Um, and then a clinical correlation with this is patients that have DeGeorge syndrome don't have a very well-developed paracortex in their lymph nodes. So what we see with the paracortex is that it enlarges when they have a very strong cellular immune response, so we have Epstein-Barr virus or other viral infections, you can actually feel the lymph nodes of the patients that have that infection because we're getting the paracortex to enlarge. So paracortex enlarges, leads to paracortical hyperplasia, and that is lymphadenopathy. So when you can feel a lymph node, typically it's because of lymphadenopathy, oftentimes due to inflammation associated with the paracortex. So let's talk a little bit about the spleen in general. As we know from our regular anatomy, this is located in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen, as you can see in this picture right here. This is residing anterolateral to the left kidney, so our left kidney is going to be a little bit more inferior and posterior from the spleen and it is protected by the ninth to the 11th ribs. It is somewhat difficult to injure your spleen. Uh, you'd need a pretty strong blunt force trauma uh, to be able to injure the spleen because of those ribs. It does have a very small portion of the spleen that could be uh, peeking out underneath that 11th rib that could be exposed to certain damages and blunt force traumas. So let's talk about the spleen more closely here. So the spleen is made up of sinusoids, which are long vascular channels uh, within our red pulp of the spleen, and it has a fenestrated barrel hoop basement membrane. So as you can see in this picture, the letter B points to the red pulp. The sinusoids are within that red pulp area. We can find T cells in the PALS area, or the periarteriolar lymphatic sheath PALS. Uh, and that's going to be within the white pulp, which is uh, under letter A on this diagram. B cells are often found in the follicles within that white pulp. And the marginal zone between those two, so if we drew a, a zone right around the edge here, the marginal zone is where we see macrophages, B cells, antigen-presenting cells all come in and capture bloodborne antigens that are able to be recognized and seen by the lymphocytes. And it is noteworthy here that within the spleen, the macrophages are what removes encapsulated bacteria. This is important for people that no longer have a spleen because that encapsulated bacteria would then no longer be able to be removed. So let's get right into that. So if you have splenic dysfunction, such as you've had to have a spleen removed, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you could have maybe had an autosplenectomy where patients that have sickle cell disease, the spleen gets damaged and enlarged so much that it is no longer functioning. Uh, or you've injured your spleen, um, then we have to remove that. So one of those two states is the most common thing you'll see. What do we have happen here? Well, with a spleen dysfunction, we're going to have low IgM. Low IgM will cause us to have low complement activation. Without the activation of complement, 
our C3B opsonization will become low, and that in turn gives us our high susceptibility to our encapsulated organisms. So let's say we have a patient that is uh, post-splenectomy. He had to have his spl spleen removed due to trauma and bleeding and internal bleeding injuries. What would we see in patients that are post-splenectomy? Well, first thing we'll see is how old jolly bodies. These are nuclear remnants, and as you can see in this particular picture here, there is a big blue nucleus piece that is a remnant inside that red blood cells. Remember, red blood cells typically don't have a nucleus inside of them, so the how jolly body is the nuclear remnant due to uh, the splenectomy. We can also see target cells. Uh, if you remember back to your red blood cell anatomy, red blood cells have that biconcave shape with that central pallor there. This here, we are actually seeing more of a target. So it looks like red, white, red, almost like a bullseye. That is called a target cell. That is a finding of our post-splenectomy patients as well. You'll also see some thrombocytosis here uh, where we can have loss of sequestration and removal uh, of the platelet cells. And then lymphocytosis here is also common in post-splenectomy patients due to the loss of sequestration. So what do we need to do to patients that have had their spleen removed or have undergone autosplenectomy because of their risk of encapsulated organism infections? Well, we need to vaccinate them vaccinate these patients against those encapsulated organisms. So what are the encapsulated organisms that we have a vaccine for? Well, that's going to be our pneumococci, our Haemophilus influenza type B, and meningococci. So we need to give all of our post-splenectomy patients, whether it be a surgical post-splenectomy or auto-splenectomy uh, due to something like sickle cell disease, get them vaccinated with these particular vaccines to help against pneumococci, HIV, and meningococci. If you found this material helpful for your studying, please like and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, share this video so that more people can benefit from it like you have.